All right. Well, let's let's pivot now to talk about another piece of anatomy down the arm, which is the elbow. Um, so uh, let's take a moment and just go back to the anatomy. Do you want to draw a little sketch yes. of how the humerus lines up with the ulna and the radius? Very much so. All right. So the big diagram is looking straight at the antecubital fossa. And then obviously the side diagram is is showing the arm flexed. So walk people yep. through what these these three bones are and then the sort of yeah. overlaying muscles. So this is, uh, as you said, the, the the front of the elbow is here. The humerus bone, which is the arm bone, is coming down. You can see it's a super weird undulating structure there, which makes it intrinsically quite stable. So much different Because there's more to about. dig into. Exactly. Yeah. There's all these fun little, you know, almost jigsaw puzzle pieces that stick together. Um, we have the radial head, which is the rotating bone of the forearm. And then we have the ulna, which is the fixed straight bone of the forearm. And then we have um, what's, what's cool about the elbow is the tendons that go down to the forearm and to the hand originate above the joint, more or less, right? A, a, close juxta articular, close to the joint, but above it. And then the ones that go from, from the shoulder and arm down uh, attach below the joint. And this is the biceps tendon here, the big biceps muscle here, the biceps tendon attaching to the radius. And we'll talk about that. This is the lateral side, the outside of your elbow. And the, the, the blue is the muscle tendon units that are attached there, anchored to this little circle or oval and then the red part is where tearing typically occurs in tennis elbow on the inside of the elbow where our funny bone nerve is the funny bone nerve is the ulnar nerve and that's that's the green structure in cross section and then overlying that is the muscles the flexor pronator muscles that that help bend the elbow and and pronate the forearm and those can tear around in this region and that's actually where we get golfer's elbow and what it's known as golfer's elbow which is medial epicondylitis medial and then the lateral side which is the tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis and those are the most these three the biceps tendon and these two are the most common tendon injuries uh, by far the fourth, which is less common, is shown in the lateral, which is the triceps coming down and attaching to the tip of our elbow. We talked about the bursa before, and there is a bursa right here that lives over the tip of our elbow, and we can get uh, the, mm -hmm. the big golf ball size uh, oh, yeah. filling of fluid, and that's the olecranon bursa. And so um, I think it's beyond what we're talking about today to go into the fractures, but any parts of these can be broken. And uh, the elbow is a very finicky joint. You can see because of, it's stable because of those undulating surfaces, but because they're undulating. There's less wiggle room. There's less force. wiggle room. And, and they, if you don't get those things perfect when you fix them, they can quickly lead to arthritis. And some of the, even the subtle fracture patterns that happen and aren't, seen or appreciated can lead to rapid destruction of the joint. So it's a finicky joint. Wow. It is also, oh, I've drawn this blue structure here, which yeah. is a very thick ligament on the inside of the elbow. That is the Tommy John ligament. It's not really Tommy John. And even, uh, well, I'll clarify that in a minute, but that's the medial collateral ligament or the ulnar collateral ligament. And that's the one that's torn in throwing athletes. Um, and that's can be a career ending, except now because of the reconstructive surgery, it's generally not. Um, yeah. So let's talk just briefly about why the um, lateral epicondyle, if there's inflammation in that tendon, we sort of think of that as the, the injury a tennis player gets, whereas inflammation in the medial tendon is more attributed to what a golfer gets. Of course, people who have never played tennis or golf often get these things, yes. but it, it could be illustrative just to explain the, the movement yeah, it's, pattern. It's great. So those are not dissimilar from the supraspinatus tendon where they have a little ringing out and they, they kind of can become degenerative and partially tear. Just like we talked about rotator cuffs, there are tons of people walking down the streets with partial tears in those tendons and they're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Use patterns are significant for that. The reason the lateral was historically associated and called tennis elbow is because of one-handed backhands. It's a much 
less mm-hmm. mechanically sound and it's we have less strength with our external rotators than we have with our pectoralis and our subscapularis for forehand shots so it's under more stress and and you can get them at any age but the sweet spot of seeing treating this is 40 to 60 40 to 60 now that that is creeping up to the 70s and so forth because again people are so active Um, so that's why it's been associated with tennis elbow Ironically, now I'm seeing just as much in tennis players and competitive tennis players, I'm seeing just as much medial epicondylitis, which is traditionally golfer's elbow. And the reason is because everybody is trying to hit massive topspin. And, and they are hit using their pronator so much more than they used to when mm. we were, when I was a kid and, and, and playing. I, I try to hit topspin now. And, um, and so that's a reason why it's, it's stimulated more. Why does the golfer get it? I don't play golf, yeah. so I don't appreciate so it. So historically, enough. historically, even though golfers were getting it, I don't know why, because you're not supposed to be, it's over hitting with your, your trailing arm. Most people play right-handed and mm. they were getting it on their right medial epicondylitis mm. because they were over hitting, hitting stumps, hitting rocks you know, duffing I and, see. and it was that Joel, again, the eccentric load yep. on these tendons, which our tendons don't like, but, um, I'm seeing now because people are hitting so much harder, they're hitting bigger clubs, especially drivers and such. They're getting more l- left leading arm, lateral epicondylitis in golfers on the leading arm on the yep. leading arm Makes because the, and that that's more logical actually yeah but they're just trying to hit harder and farther and you know once these you know big hitters are on there they're trying to mimic them and so forth so is the first line treatment for that rest yes. followed by you know rest and NSAIDs presumably followed by cortisone and things of that nature Right. Um, so the first line of treatment is always is rest, good stretching, just like you stretch your hamstrings to keep from tearing them as frequently or injuring them as frequently. And, uh, and usually just answer insets by mouth. If they're on, uh, rarely do I use physical therapy for these formally because it's just not much to do. But, um, if the, if they're just too painful to even, some people wake up in the morning, they can't even straighten their elbow out. They're mm-hmm. so painful. They're so spongy and really inflamed. So those, I still don't splint them, but I have them stretch, but more often because they can't use their arm, I will go ahead and give them kind of a half dose of cortisone just to cool everything down. And yeah. You injected me yeah. probably four or five years ago yeah. when I was sort of in the transition of really learning how to control my scapula and had sort of overcooked too many pull-ups yeah, and yeah. all this pull-up pain was translating into yes. tennis elbow. Yeah. Um, I was surprised at, and it was stubborn. I mean, I, this thing, I, I, I came to you after six months of yeah. pain. Um, but that one injection cooled it off and it never hurt again yeah. Yeah. because basically I had already fixed the underlying movement pattern. I just needed to cool yeah. the fire off. Yeah, is that a is. common scenario? It really is. Okay. It really is. I, and again, I don't operate on, I mean, I, because it's so common, I end up doing a lot of these procedures, but I don't operate on, I'd say one out of five at the most, 20% at the most, most people get better. And so operating on the lateral versus the medial side, what are the indications? Yeah. Um, the, the indications are the same failing conservative treatment, a lot of stretching, a lot of strengthening, a lot of people get these in your case, it was mechanics overdoing, but a lot of people get these because they're they're getting back into something that they haven't been doing in a long time and they mm-hmm. overdo it. And it can be just weights and weightlifting, but honestly, it's something as mundane. I'll see these after people have gone traveling for two weeks, just lifting their luggage, look, dragging yeah, their yeah. luggage around, you know, so it's all comers, but the, 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 the theme is that conditioning if they've had it chronically, not in your case, of course, but a lot of people come in and they're already kind of weak. They don't have strong grip strength. They don't have good tone. Mm-hmm. And so strengthening is a critical component. If I can get, if they can squeeze my, you know, I have one of my devices, if they can squeeze that without just a little pain, then I just have them do that first, stretching and strengthening. Yep. Okay. And, and, and sometimes that'll cure it and often it'll cure it. Then, it, but if they can't squeeze it without undue pain, I give them a little dose of cortisone. If it's chronic like yours was, then it, there's not that much to do. You're fit, 
you're you've got great tone and you've got full motion so it's only yeah give it a little booster dose just to knock it out we think sometimes we haven't ever done the study to prove it but we think sometimes just sticking the needle in a few times kind of stimulates a healing response. yeah i've certainly seen a lot of anecdotal stuff around dry needling yeah. just getting the dry needle in there yeah, i believe um, in that yeah and just uh increasing the influx of inflammatory uh uh, cells and cleaning up, getting macrophages to come and clean it up. Yeah, yeah. So outside of fractures, how often are you seeing acute injuries to the elbow that ultimately are surgical cases? Yeah. So one of the common ones is the um, middle-aged but very active fit person who maybe had a little antecedent elbow pain or forearm pain. They didn't quite know what it was, but they did workarounds and then they rupture their distal biceps. And so they get a Popeye muscle. It's all weird and, and even quivering. And they come in, they go, oh my God, you've got to do something. And um, the cool thing about the bicep, we think of the biceps as, as being, you know, we do biceps curls. Right, it's an elbow flexor. But it, and, it, and it is a secondary elbow flexor, but it's the primary supinator of the mm. forearm. So people come in and they lose when they when they tear their biceps. They don't lose that much flexion strength, but they lose tr most of their supination strength. So if they are used to turning screwdrivers, wrenches, um, even surgical instruments, maybe depending on what they do, um, then it, it it can be really disabling. So that factors into the physical exam then, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's funny. They'll come in. They won't be painful. They'll say, I think it's better. And yeah, I've got this, but I can live with the deformity, which I don't care about the deformity either. Um, and then I will pronate them to wrap that tendon kind of around the radius. And then I have them pull up like they're doing a pronated curl and they scream. And it's just, you get it just isolated. And that's a very good point about that. And then you test their supination. They didn't know that they didn't have any supination strength. And you test their other side, they can lift you off the table. And then this side, they can't even do it. So um, so when you surgically repair that, are you reattaching the tendon yeah. at same same place? So it's yeah. like a tendinesis. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. It's great operation. So that's and, a good uh, outcome operation. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had a guy in the other day, it just looks just like you, you know, good, good, strong arms and everything. And he's doing this all the time and he ruptured his and, um, he came back in for, uh, actually with his son. And he said, he said, man, if you need anybody to, he said, my arm is stronger than it's been in a long time. And that's, I'll, I'll speak to that. But he said, he said, yeah, if you need somebody to, to, to call anybody to talk to him about how great this operation is, just let me know. But he was. He said he was, a lot of them say, you know, I feel almost like I'm stronger than I was before. Well, you're only putting it back where it came from, but they probably had a partial tear for a long time. They were yep. working around. They were a little deconditioned in their biceps. They were compensating for their, with their brachialis, the big muscle underneath that. And, um, so that, and then they get even stronger because they have a good tendon again. Wow. Yeah. We talked, you want to just briefly talk about the Tommy John, which again yeah, sure. has kind of revolutionized <laughs> Major League Baseball. Yeah. So when this tears, um, when this tears the- um, On the medial side. You all of, and in fact, it's supraphysiologic torques. That ligament is subjected to supraphysiologic in throwers, in high level throwers who are throwing 90 plus miles per hour. It is subjected to such, such forces, traction forces that it will rupture. And the way they keep from rupturing in general is by fitness, by steady long-term fitness. And that's flexor pronator fitness, that's shoulder, streakness, uh, uh, shoulder strengthening, and uh, biceps, triceps, and so forth. By strengthening everything around it, you can protect that ligament. And if you don't, then it can rupture because it's being subjected repetitively over and over and over again, year after year to supraphysiologic loads. And um, so when it ruptures, it's easy. Instantaneously, they lose, they can throw, but they lose 10 miles per hour on their fastball. They just, it, it just immediately downgrades their ability to throw. That's so interesting because most of us wouldn't, I mean, like, I don't think I could throw a ball 50 miles an hour. So <laughs> to think like, does that mean I would go from 50 to 40? No. Or it just means I could never get, I wouldn't notice it. Is that the difference? You wouldn't notice it. Yeah. And so we don't, that's the, that's the common fallacy. I have people come in all the time and they, all of us playing 
tennis, uh, playing uh, certainly golf, throwing Just balls, playing catch, if yeah. we're playing catch, we don't need it. We don't need the ligament. So that is literally an operation that is only designed for the most elite throwers. Yes, period. Awesome. And that's a common misconception. And of course, one of the... I, I, and this so is, are there some shady people... Sorry to interrupt you. Are there some shady people out there that are doing that operation on non-athletes? Sure. Sure. But more importantly, and I say this, I'm sure they have love in their heart, but there's some shady parents too who will bring their kids in who say, you know, we know our kid has this great potential. Can you do, because uh, stories about Tommy John surgery, which this is not Tommy John surgery anymore. What was done on Tommy John was not the same operation. Mm -hmm. It was the same ligament, but it's totally different now. Uh, but it's good to refer to it as that. I, it's nothing, the guy who invented it was brilliant. Um, but um, parents will come in and say, you know, my, my kid needs five miles per hour on the fastball. And because so many people like the biceps have had partial tears, They've finally torn, had a reconstruction, and they gain six or seven miles faster than they've thrown as an adult. It's, it's because they had a partial tear and never could get that final extra velocity. And then once they have a re reconstruction, they can. And so that travels through the chat rooms and lore. And then parents come in and say, hey, can and their kid has no problem. And they say, can, can we do it? Uh, Tommy John so that we can get more velocity. And you have to explain to them that there's nothing wrong with their kid's elbow. There's just something that the kid is not destined to be, uh, you know, Nolan Ryan. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, and it's, it's with best of intentions, but you know, things get distorted. Um, yeah. what about the, uh, tricep tendon? Does that yeah. ever, uh, what, what, what type of injury will, will, uh, injure that tendon to the point where it's coming off the olecranon? Well, you already know. It, we, it's what you, you talk about all the time. It's the eccentric loading. Uh, so it's the, they almost always tear falling skiing where they're trying to stop themselves from smashing their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. They rip off like that. I see them every winter. And know, how clean a that. break is it? It varies. Some people... If they've had chronic condition, we'll have little bone spurs in there and it'll pull off kind of part of the bone spur and everything. Usually it pulls off the bone or leaves a little stub there. And uh, it's pretty clean usually. But man, it, it's a, the triceps is a huge muscle. Bigger huge, than biceps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huge muscle. And so it's really disabling. People can't even push up out of chairs. You have to fix those. Yep. I mean, you have to. I mean, there's, they're not ruptured in sedentary, non low functioning people. They rupture in active people. You've got to fix them. Okay. So maybe now we could just kind of have you examine my elbow and sure. go through all of these planes of motion. Cause obviously you want to know how I'm flexing, how I'm extending, yes. supinating and pronating yes. and, um, my strength eccentrically and concentrically, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And in the elbow, it's, it's very distinct. There are very specific stresses you can put on the elbow that will guide you guide us directly to what is hurting and again it goes back to a lot of middle-aged athletic people have some changes in the lateral epicondylocondyle muscles the medial epicondyle muscles some even in the triceps in the distal biceps you have to isolate those and make sure they're symptomatic Okay, so as we were discussing, the elbow is a super weird, complicated joint, and there's a lot of things going on there. So let's cover that a little bit and see what's, what's going on. So one of the cool things about, as we talked about, is that carrying angle. And I'm going to look and see, do you have symmetry? Do you have any swelling? Do you have any um, things that look atypical? Well, I can tell you one that's super easy to just to see. If you rupture your distal biceps, as many people who are doing CrossFit, being pushed by people that are half their age in the gym and being pushed too much. They rupture the distal biceps here and then your biceps contour shifts up. So if we come right here and we look, you have a nice distal, distal muscle belly that's way, way down, which is what you want. That level, you're about two finger breasts, mm -hmm. will go up four finger breasts and it just, it's disconnected. And what's weird about that is 
it's not. So if I test you in supination like that, whether you have a good biceps or not, you're going to be super strong and it's not going to hurt because that's mostly brachialis, that underlying broad, strong muscle that gives us our basic curling capability. The biceps is cool because, and we can watch your biceps because it's well defined, is we go from pronation to supination with a little resistance. I'll just resist a little bit. You go there, you can see it ball up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's contracting and pulling up. That biceps is the primary supinator. So I'm testing that. Now, if I have you supinate and it hurts or it's weak, then we know something's going on right there. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, if I have you do a pronated curl in that position, that will hurt like crazy if you have even a partial tear of the distal biceps. And that pain, people say, well, it's not my biceps, it's down in here, but that's where it attaches. It's way down in here, uh, it attaches to the radius and mm -hmm. rotates the radius. So that's a super cool, super great, easy way to chest. Now, if we look at the lateral epicondyle, we talked about tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis, that's down here, very pinpoint. You know, people say, how did you know where it was? Well, it's, it's not hard because that's where everything happens and it's right there. The ECRB tendon lies deep right next to the bone and it will often be swollen, spongy, very tender. So we palpate that, we can see it, we sponge it. And sometimes I can feel, if it's a medium size, partial thickness tear, I can feel the defect in there just with my thumb. And people don't like that, you don't keep torturing them. Then with the elbow straight, I have you pull up against me and like that, and that will hurt badly. Now for some reason when we flex this way, and pull up again, it hurts a little less. We, I don't even know why that is. I've never been able to figure that out. But both of those will hurt with tennis elbow. And that's a pretty simple, straightforward diagnosis. Now on the inside, I'll use this elbow. The medial epicondyle, which is golfer's elbow, is it tends to be even more tender. And I think that's because the ulnar nerve lies so close to it. Uh, and it's very spongy, very swollen, very tender right there. It's a little bit different anatomically in terms of the way the tendon inserts. So these need surgery much less, but man, when they're on fire, they really hurt. People can't even press, you know, it's this movement here. That's what really uh, causes that to hurt there. Now, in your case, and we're gonna talk about the nerves, I think later, uh, but you have, I wanna feel your nerve and I can, you can see that I can roll your ulnar nerve the funny bone nerve up over that medial epicondyle bone. So you have a very mobile ulnar nerve. And we'll talk about that a little more, but, but that's, that's a normal variant and that's just what it is and that's fine. Um, okay, let's see. Now, very importantly in the elbow, we wanna look at range of motion. It's very common for athletes, longtime weightlifters, uh, football players, um, you know, all sorts of people to have a contracture of the elbow. So you have nice, full, mild hyperextension, not dramatic. If you have genetic laxity, sometimes that'll go back 45 degrees. You don't, it's just nice, full, easy motion, minus, I would call it minus 10 degrees at the most. And then I look at your flexion, which is normally up around 150 degrees and so forth. Again, from that zero position. Very important to look at that. We need we, we know a functional arc is about a 100 degree arc. We can function well, but we have to get up to about 130 to be able to get to our hair and face and, and, and mouth. And so that's a common result of minor fractures in the elbow, inflammation in the elbow, and uh, so forth. Um, professional pitchers, almost all of them have about a 15 to 20 degree elbow contracture from all the loads that have been put on the elbow. And they're functional, they're fine. Um, we're going to talk about the nerves later. So that's really the, oh, the triceps. So the triceps attaches here on the olecranon. And you've got a big, well-developed triceps here, and we've got, we've got your, your triceps inserting there. Now we can watch that. And people who are doing a lot of weightlifting, especially if they've been out of it for a long time, or they're doing a lot of push-ups, things, that's where they'll get the triceps tendonitis or a partial rupture. You talked about the eccentric loading. If you if you land hard and you have that eccentric load, you can tear off part or all of the triceps. That's a miserable, always surgical diagnosis because you just can't do anything. You can't even push up out of a chair. You need that big triceps. So we look at that. Now, if you just have tendonitis, what I'll do is I'll hyperflex and then have you push against me like this, push hard. That hurts like crazy if you have any inflammation there because there's such a biomechanical disadvantage when it's trying to 
extend from a very flexed position. Mm -hmm. Um, you know better than me, and it, so what do you think is the ideal, since you do a lot of this and talk to a lot of your patients about it, what do you think is the, I, I don't know the answer to this, the ideal position for doing triceps workouts? I mean, I think the, the literature actually suggests that you, you want to be um, in a, um, an extended position of the humerus, okay. right? or flexed positions, right? So uh -huh. you want a humeral flexed. So that to, the, stretch the, to stretch the okay, triceps, you okay. want the tricep to be under a stretch. Interesting. It's so it's it. better than doing them down here. Correct. Interesting. So, okay. So basically, if you're on your back doing like a Got skull it. pressure, I see. or if you're using a pulley, yeah. doing it kind of overhead. Okay, that's that, that's um, informative. But that of course for me. assumes your shoulders can tolerate it. So, for example, when I was recovering from my surgery, mm -hmm. I the only thing I could do down here. I'm having a towel between my arms. Yeah, yeah. And I'm doing this way. Yeah. And I'm doing this way, and that's okay. all I could do. Right. So it's it's really just a function. Of okay, that's that's great. I did not know that, and I hadn't I hadn't even uh, really thought about that before. That's good to know. Okay, um, so that's that's pretty much all of the the muscle tendon units that are commonly injured around the elbow. <laughs> Thank you.